Grace and peace to you from our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. My name is pastoral intern Sarah Swindoll. Good morning and welcome to chapel. Today, we are blessed to hear a good word from President Paul Pribonow, who will be speaking on the John 20 text, where the risen Jesus visits the disciples as they are huddled together in fear and tends to their doubt. The Gospel this morning is from the Gospel of John, the 20th chapter, beginning with the 19th verse. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. The Gospel of the Lord. Alleluia. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. It's good to be with you this morning for our virtual chapel service and certainly especially meaningful these days after Easter 
and in particular just here at the end of our spring term in our 150th anniversary year in this pandemic time. It's a scary time, but it's good that we still come together in so many ways, especially in these chapel services to celebrate our community. <clears throat> I'm trying to imagine the disciple Thomas being interviewed by a modern day TV talk show host, say Oprah. Okay, Thomas, what, what gives here with your behavior? Well, Ms. Winfrey, it's really quite simple. I, I missed a meeting and all of a sudden my fellow disciples are trying to tell me that our leader who all of us saw hanging on a cross has shown up behind closed and locked doors. I'm sorry, Oprah. I'm a good sport and a faithful disciple, but this was too much for me. I just couldn't accept this without some evidence. I needed to touch the man before I could get on board. Certainly your audience would agree with me that this was not asking too much, to which the audience would respond with sincere amens, empathizing with poor Thomas. And perhaps we might add our own amens. I know that on many days I would. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. But is it really that simple? As many of you know, my 19-year-old son and first-year Augie is named Thomas, a not insignificant fact to me. And there have been many days, many days throughout Thomas's life that his fresh and clear-eyed challenges to what I, I and his mother and countless other adults, perhaps some of our faculty members, ask him to accept as gospel strike me as fitting and healthy. Maybe Thomas, both the disciple and my son, ask the questions that the rest of us don't have the courage to ask. Maybe they remind us that our faith journeys in this world are shaped not so much by blind allegiance, but by seeking answers to the questions that nag at us about what God intends for us, what God is doing in our midst, and what we are called to do in response to God's reign breaking into our lives. Perhaps, especially in these pandemic times, they remind us that the world can be a scary place and that the way of faith is not about making things easier, but about finding the courage and will to overcome the fear. Perhaps asking our questions is how faith grows so that God's work might be done in the world. I'm struck by the fear that is evident in these stories, all the stories that we read in the days after Easter. Can we imagine what it was like for the early faithful whose leader had been killed like a common criminal? I think maybe we can. I think maybe we can understand the fear because it remains such a force in our personal and social lives here in the 21st century, in particular in these days. Think about the fear that is gripping our public lives in these pandemic times. How many times do we need to hear from elected officials about who we can trust or not trust to guide us through these uncharted waters? How often must we be reminded about race and gender and class as personal liabilities? How will we ever deal with the various intimations of disaster from within and without that are thrown into our path as evidence that we can't trust, that we dare not forget to be vigilant, perhaps that we may not survive? Where are the voices of civility and trust, the wise and calm counsel, the shouts of affirmation and hope dreams of a better life, a more just society, a sense of what is possible? Or what about the fear that is so present in our relations to our neighbors, especially around the world? As you probably know, just before the pandemic, I spent several days at our Center for Global Education and Experience site in Cuernavaca, Mexico. It is a remarkable place, and our staff there is so skilled at introducing their many students and visitors to real people living meager economic existences. And as we meet these fellow global citizens, we also learn of the many ways in which the policies of our own country, too often based in fear of losing economic power or world status, our corporate fears, how these policies have contributed mightily to the state of these good people. Where are the voices of global fairness and equity, the shouts of empowerment and love, the will to believe that abundance is possible when we learn to share our vast resources? And then finally, there is the fear in our own neighborhood and campus community. 
especially now when we must keep our distance from each other, it is so easy to withdraw into our own silos and to believe that we're alone in this fight. Our many fears of, will I get sick? What's next for me? Who can I trust? Leads us to hoard what we have, to refuse to believe that the good of the entire community might be worth pursuing, to criticize those whose efforts are aimed at making us all stronger. Where are the voices of responsibility and vision, the shouts of commitment and action, the foresight to see our ways together into a remarkable future? This post-Easter fear is so much a part of our lives that sometimes we are unable to see how it blinds us to its implications. It paralyzes us from taking a stand. It creates obstacles to activism and change. It keeps us ever fearful and unable to see how and why we might work together to do God's will in the world. But today, today is different as we come together as God's people in this place to take an important stand at this time, to proclaim that this community will not live in fear, that we will not give in to those who would tear apart rather than build up our lives together. Today, we claim and proclaim that ours is a community of hospitality for our fellow travelers in the journey of faith, asking our tough questions together, seeking to know God's will for our lives, committed to doing God's work in the world, and we will not be afraid. And here comes Thomas, the absent and doubting disciple looking for evidence. Here too, here too is Peter who denied that he knew Jesus three times. And here are the others who ran away in fear as the cross was lifted on that fateful hill. Here is a room full of disciples, not unlike all of us, flawed, anxious, seeking, but also present listening for a call, recognizing the gift, ready for a promise. And here is Jesus, the risen Christ, in our midst with nary a word of condemnation. He might have said, what's with you guys? Why don't you believe? Instead, these words of comfort and redemption for all of us who live in fear. Peace be with you. Peace be with you. Thanks be to God. Amen.